It's the Farmer to Farmer podcast, episode 49, and this is your host, Chris Blanchard. Mark Shepard's new forest farm in Viola, Wisconsin, isn't your average farm. After 21 years of an intentional conversion from 106 acres of corn, beans, and overgrazed pasture to a chestnut, hazelnut, and apple minnick of the oak savanna, New Forest Farm presents an alternative just about every way of thinking about agriculture that you'll find out there. Mark, the author of Restoration Agriculture, is not just a nuts and fruits guy. He used the cash flow from his low input vegetable operation to bootstrap his longer term plantings. In addition to getting into some of the basics of Mark's approach to creating a permanent agriculture, we dig into his personal history, how he came to his farm in southwest Wisconsin, issues of scale and finance, and how Mark managed his vegetable operation during the startup of his perennial polyculture. We also spend some time talking about how to take some of Mark's ideas and apply them to a more conventional market farming setup. I've had the good fortune to work with Mark in various capacities over 15 years now, and I've been to his farm a few times over the years, and I can tell you it's a pretty cool place. And Mark's got some ways of looking at things that will likely challenge at least a few of the ways you're looking at your farm and the whole farm and food system. Hope you enjoy this show as much as I enjoyed recording it. Going to get a couple words from our sponsors, and we'll be to the show in just a moment. The Farmer to Farmer podcast is made possible with the generous support of Vermont Compost Company, founded by organic crop growing professionals committed to meeting the need for high quality composts and compost based living soils for certified organic plant production. VermontCompost.com. Bandwidth for the Farmer to Farmer podcast is provided by BCS America. BCS two wheel tractors are versatile, maneuverable in tight spaces, lightweight for less compaction, and easy to maintain and repair on farm. Gear driven and built to last for decades of dependable service. BCSAmerica.com. Mark Shepard, welcome to the Farmer to Farmer podcast. Hi there, Chris. How are you doing? I'm doing really well. How are you today? Good, good, good. I'm hanging in there, hanging in there. It's a beautiful, beautiful sunny day. It's crisp and cold, but it's, it's so wonderful. Six degrees this morning. Out there in uh, the Driftless region of Wisconsin. Yes. Mark, I've given a little bit of background, but can you help set the stage here with, with New Forest Farm as it is now? Let's see, as it is now. This is uh, the 21st year, our 21st year here on the farm of uh, it has been an intentional conversion of a typical uh, corn and beans and overgrazed uh, hill country farm into a oak savanna mimic. And uh, what we would do is, is pick out the, the most keystone species in the oak savanna, obviously the oak, which are fagaceae. Uh, so for the fagaceae, we substituted chestnut, which is also fagaceae, as apples. In an understory, cherries is an understory, hazelnut is the dominant shrub, a lot of wild plums that happen all on their own, raspberries, uh, gooseberries, currants, grapes crawling all over the mess, uh, and then livestock. So 20 years in, uh, most of the system, the backbone, the, the uh, perennial Woody's education is all is mostly established. You know, there's uh, gaps here and there that, that we're filling in over time. Uh, we've been doing 20 years worth of selecting uh, and breeding for uh, species that are early to reproduce, produce more you know, nuts or fruit than their neighbors, require no uh, soil amendment, no you know, herbicides, fertilizers, fungicides, pesticides, you know, pest or disease control whatsoever. So they're uh, uh, mostly, mostly seedling plants instead of uh, grafted plants. So almost every single plant on the farm is a, a genetically unique individual. Um, our primary crops in the early years were uh, produce, organic produce. We've been a member of the Organic Valley Produce Pool for 20 years, which still are. Once upon a time, maybe I was doing 10, 12 acres of uh, produce. And as other uh, parts of the system have come into production, we've been able to back off on the uh, organic produce some more. And so we've got two acres of asparagus right now. It's in its, this is its 20th year of, of production. And then we'll do two or three acres of uh, mostly acorn squash because it's so fast and easy. Um, chestnut uh, harvests are, are uh, increasing. This is probably like the beginning of a, of a fairly rapid increase in production coming from chestnuts. Uh, hazelnuts are uh, in various stage stages of um, uh, production because we've doing, been doing a lot more breeding work with them. And mostly what I'm focusing on with the hazelnuts is uh, 
um, working with the uh, equipment, designing the equipment for husking, cracking, cleaning, sorting, and separating, pressing oil, that sort of thing. And then on the apples side of thing, those are big three that just not pay as much in the apples. The apples, uh, we do have a licensed hard cider winery that with the popularity of my book and a couple of experiences with distributors that were not all that positive. Um, we're kind of on a vacation right now while uh, I'm in negotiations with another guy uh, to take over the, uh, the cider uh, production part of the operation. So I'm curious, I mean, you, you just mentioned the market for the cider. Um, what do you do with 106 acres of chestnuts? Oh, my gosh. Uh, Tom Wall of the Prairie Grove Chestnut Co-op in Wapolo, Iowa, uh, has done some market research. Or his, he did the math on this, that the amount of chestnuts that are being planted nationwide in the USA is about 600 acres a year nationwide. That's not a lot. When you talk about how big the nation is. At that rate of growing, of planting chestnuts, excuse me, and, uh, and how long it takes for chestnuts to come into production, five to seven years before they really start producing well, um, it will take us 40 years to catch up with the market demand for chestnuts back in 1980. So for all practical purposes, it's, it's mathematically almost impossible to keep up with the demand for chestnuts. But what is the demand for chestnuts? And I'm going to ask you the same thing about hazelnuts. I mean, where, where, does, where, do, those, where do those products go? They uh, fresh market sales, most of them. That's, that's where most of mine goes, directly to people who just buy them. Um, there, are, there are cultures other than Americans that have, uh, have a very strong tradition of uh, chestnut use. Um, I, it used to be, I don't know if it is anymore, it used to be that one of the top uses of chestnuts was for, uh, it was actually used similar to like wheat flour or corn flour as uh, just an extra carbohydrate filler in baby food, believe it or not. It was because it's, uh, it's non-allergenic, um, chestnuts non-allergenic. And so fresh market sales, I haven't, I haven't had to, to have, you know, hardly lift a finger to get rid of any chestnuts that we grow. Any produce distributor will carry chestnuts seasonally. You know, they are, uh, it's like sweet corn in that it doesn't, they don't last a long time. They, uh, they'll start to mold if, if you don't uh, store them properly. And uh, so the, the fresh market season for chestnuts is basically, you know, from when they start to be ripe, which can be as early as uh, middle of September, all the way up to Christmas time, basically for fresh uh, chestnuts. They can be dehydrated. They can be turned into noodles. I've actually uh, had them made into pasta before. I've had them made into a Cheetos equivalent before. So the potential for it is, is huge um, at scale. You said you've had them made into a Cheetos equivalent. Yeah, I did. <laughs> that, was, that was a while ago, probably five or six years ago. That was actually longer ago than that. Is that, is that complete with the orange coating? It, they, they didn't put the orange on it for this one because it wanted to uh, have a, a all-natural product. And at the time, we could have put a little, like a red coloring in it, which was either a natto or a beet powder to make it red. But I figured, what the heck, why bother? Just make it look different on the shelf. When you talk about chestnut noodles, I mean, you're talking about a basically a wheat flour replacement. I've had gluten-free noodles before that were barely edible. Are, are these, I mean, when you, when you make chestnut noodles, is it something that you can actually stand to eat? <laughs> of course, the taste is either A, all in your mouth or all in your head, or it's an acquired thing and it's different between people. Uh, and also the product it would be different by manufact different manufacturers. I had uh, 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 an instant noodle made, like a ramen noodle. And if you think ramen noodles are edible, these were edible. You know, I think ramen noodles are fairly tasteless. They're just a medium to hold seasonings, you know, like lots of butter. <laughs> so yep. they, were, they were all right. I think they were all right. What about the hazelnuts? Where are those going? Uh, hazelnuts right now, I'm using most of it for developing equipment because uh, the medium scale uh, equipment, you know, there's, there's tabletop hand crank stuff that's available, and there's mega industrial scale stuff that's available, um, but there's nothing in the middle for, you know, medium scale farmers to adopt. So I'm, I'm designing a lot of that equipment, have a patent on, uh, on Nutcracker, um, did not receive a patent on, uh, on a dehydrator and a husker because they were too similar to other technologies. Um, but 
right now, if you think about Nutella alone, everybody knows what Nutella is. And uh, last I looked, Nutella was about a, a $400 million uh, market in the USA. And most of those nuts are coming from Turkey. And so uh, the Ferrero Rocher company is shipping them in from Turkey, sending them to a facility west of Toronto where they're processed and made into this product. And, and think about that, $400 million worth of Nutella divided by how many dollars per ounce. It's like thousands and thousands and thousands of acres, you know, probably 100,000 acres of, of uh, hazelnuts just to go into Nutella. That's not to mention all of the all of the different um, candies that they make that have a chocolate, the confection, baking goods. The reason why you don't see hazelnuts available in the um, like in the nut section very often is because uh, there's just not enough available um, worldwide. But one of the things about about the marketing with crops like that you have to understand a lot of my perspective. Uh, I used to be the produce coordinator at Organic Valley. I was responsible for organizing the growers and selling the product. And I dealt with distributors uh, and brokers, and we were dealing with, like, you know, 10 pallet truckloads to semi-trailers worth of product at a time. Right. So for, for, for people who aren't familiar, now, you know, I'm, I'm living in Wisconsin. You're from Wisconsin. When we say Crop Organic Valley, we know what we're talking about. But this is the organic dairy cooperative that actually got started as a vegetable cooperative. And and how many growers are currently in it? I think it's a couple hundred, right, no, for, no, for the no. vegetables oh, now? Oh, yeah. for, pro, for produce, it's a couple hundred. But you know, the, whole, the whole co-op is 2,500. Right. And the vegetable growers are pooling their product and and like you said, putting together semi loads full of produce all summer long. Let's take let's just take cucumbers and zucchini as an example. If you're a small scale grower, you're taking cucumbers to farmers market on Saturday. Well, if it's cucumber season, what does everybody else have at farmers market? Cucumbers. You bring in forty pounds of cucumbers, and everybody's trying to sell cucumbers. So I try to lower my price a little bit as it's raced to the bottom to a certain extent. Uh, people aren't buying cucumbers because they have a garden at home and they've got cucumbers. So the individual, the small uh, farmer individual, has the real true experience of going to market and finding out that they have too many cucumbers and they can't sell them. Therefore, there's not enough market for it. They try to take them to the co-op. They try to take them to the local grocery store, and they just can't sell all their cucumbers. Well, the problem is, the real problem is they don't have enough cucumbers to access the real market. So in the produce pool, for example, if we have 200 growers, all of us growing cucumbers, we can each bring our 200 pounds down. So 200 by 200, now we have 400,000 pounds of cucumbers. It goes on a semi and it's out of here. It goes into the real market. Just look at look at the uh, sheer quantity of produce that's coming out of the state of California. Um, it's just not it's not small. And so the 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 market for hazels is the same thing. People will see that is you go to the co-op and there's only hazels on the end cap for a few brief weeks um, in the fall. Oh, therefore, there's no market for hazels, right? No, because it's not enough hazel. Hazels are hazels are in every other aisle of the grocery store, um, in oils and confections and flowers and cakes and cookies and pie crust and all that sort of stuff. Well, if you're going to be making um, organic pie crust with uh, hazelnut flour, you have to have enough hazelnut flour to produce your product. And there aren't enough um, growers out there producing enough of this product at scale in order to put it into these uh, industrial uh, ingredients, industrially distributed ingredients. And we have, to, we have to face the fact every one of us go to a grocery store or a food co-op at some point in time, 99% of the food in that store came on a semi-truck, came from a big, huge distributor across the road and the rail, all the food miles, things that people whine about. That's, but that's just a fact. It's a reality. Our food is industrially produced, huge quantity. Uh, it's, it's usually planted mechanically, maintained mechanically, harvested mechanically, um, processed mechanically, transported mechanically at a huge industrial scale. And that's, that's part of what the magic of what Organic Valley has done, which allowed us small-time farmers to band together and we get our economies of scale at the aggregation, processing, distribution side of things. I still get paid squat for my cucumbers because I'm just a cucumber farmer. But I own a piece of this company that, you know, has a billion dollars of annual sales. 
my 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 ownership uh, membership at Organic Valley is my retirement account. How many how many produce growers do you know have you know worked and slaved their life away for twenty years and have a retirement account? So when you say that's your retirement account, that's something that you're able to sell. Yeah, you just cash out because you make your you uh, a co-op is owned by members, and so you make your investment at the beginning based on a uh, a percentage of your overall growth sales, and you can either continue to have money taken out of your check every single uh, uh, pay period, and you can have the interest uh, that it, uh, accrues have it reinvested. And so that's what I've done. Is I've had continual uh, removals from my paycheck and have all of the interest reinvested. You know, I'm not going to retire rich, okay? <laughs> but it's just the point that you can actually, by, by taking a little bit of a hit up front, I'm not making the same price per pound selling my asparagus as you might with a CSA or a farmer's market. Uh, but that's worth uh, the, the, I don't have any more hassle with marketing. You know, I get a call from Jeff once a week. He says, what you got? I tell him what I got. He says, bring it down. Tuesday at 4 in the afternoon. Cool. That's it for marketing. It's a real advantage. That's somebody else's job is to figure out where to sell my produce, and I like it that way. So one of your real advantages with where you chose to start New Forest Farm was that you had access to a market like this. <laughs> well, when we got here, it wasn't like that. I was grower number 24. And so, <laughs> I mean, with the whole entire, uh, all of the employees and all of the farmers could sit around like two picnic tables. And uh, the, the office was in the back of a bus. There was no such thing as a computer. And if you tried to make a, a phone call out of your local, uh, you know, your town, it was like a dollar fifty a minute to talk to someone. It was a different world. So, so no, we didn't have a market lined up. We showed up here. True story. My wife and I, our infant son, and two dogs. We showed up here on a piece of uh, rundown property with no infrastructure on it whatsoever. Uh, no house, no well, no septic, no electricity, none of that. We had to start completely from scratch. And so with. Uh, my original investment on the on the farming side of things was a thousand dollars. I had a rototiller, a bunch of hand tools. That's what we started with. Sixty five dollars. Wow. Sixty five dollars worth of seed that first year. I remember that. <laughs> that was ooh, man. That was a stretch. Sixty five bucks. Wow. When you guys moved to Southwest Wisconsin, did you move there with the intention of doing what you've done? Yeah, we did. That was that was the reason for moving here. You know, what we that was one of the reasons for moving here was to uh, was to figure out how to create an ecosystem based agriculture. And of course, in the early years, I'm looking across the street right now uh, from the farm, and there's uh, the neighbors bearing cornfields. Um, that's what our farm looked like 20 years ago. The goal was to figure out how to create a fully three-dimensional uh, oak savanna-based agriculture on this site. The uh, species, the varieties that we were going to use didn't exist, so we had to do our own breeding. Think about how crazy, I mean, I even can't believe this myself. What kind of, kind of like 29-year-old kid, I'll call him a kid because I'm almost done with that now, uh, says, yeah, I'm going to go move to a place where there are no varieties of these trees uh, in existence right now, and I'm going to grow them and run a farm based on that and start an industry. Yeah, I mean, that does seem a little bit nuts, Mark. Well, ha, ha, ha. Sorry. <laughs> Keep playing on the words. But, the, but the, the, you know, if you go ahead and read Restoration Agriculture, it's all laid out in there. What's interesting about that, I, I read a review once. This guy, one guy says, oh, I've read this book, and I have several flaws in his reasoning. It's like, wait, 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 wait. It's not several flaws in my reasoning. This is what I did. I'm just sharing what I did. There's no, um, you know, no university researcher uh, just plunk ourselves down here and we just try to figure this out on the fly as we go and we're still here. Well, and that seems like something that that is kind of a hallmark of your approach is figuring it out on the fly and, and what's still what's still there is is what sticks. <laughs> So what are you throwing on the wall? <laughs> yeah. Well, when I moved to the country and, and started a farm, um, 
you know, in 1999 in, in Northeast Iowa, I, I mean, that was, that was a pretty weird and crazy thing to do at that point. I mean, and that was just a, that was a vegetable farm, right? Oh. I mean, that's, that's not, not quite as wacky as I'm going to turn agriculture on its head. Um, I mean, what the hell made you think that you were going to pull this off? Um, basically, <laughs> why, why do anything else? You know, I, there's huge challenges in the world. Uh, they were just as huge back then, and they need some huge answers. And instead of worrying about it or, you know, hoping someone else is going to come up with solutions while I, you know, live some kind of, you know, dispassionate, miserable life of slavery somewhere, I'm going to get passionate about some sort of set of ideals and, you know, just work my buns off uh, and figure it out on the fly. And, you know, like I said, we're still here. It's pretty revolutionary. But what I wanted to go back to is, I don't know if the listeners know that, you know, you and I have been, you know, kind of neighbors, so to speak, about 100 miles distant off of the side of the Mississippi River, but doing similar things in, in a similar region and climate and all that. We've known each other for a, a long period of time. And so our stories were the same. The difference between what we've been doing and what you were doing is we use produce as the stepping stone and as the cash cow to start a uh, uh, successional process where we started to plant these other species, these longer lived species. And so, for example, if you had a, uh, an acre of uh, what's used, you know, zucchini and cucumbers, because we've mentioned it before, plant a row of trees on either side of that. You know, those trees might take five, seven years to start to produce anything. In the meantime, we're going to cash flow with the produce in the middle. We have agroforestry technique called alley cropping. And that, that has been instrumental to everything that we've done. We started with, you know, a lot more alley crops. Um, crops, we've grown everything from corn and beans, uh, you know, small grains, lots of small grains. Uh, another technique is, is to graze animals in the alleys in between. And that's a technique called silver pasture. And we've had, you know, cattle and sheep and chickens and pigs. A lot, of, a, lot of, a lot of people also say, well, what is your system? No. Well, it's kind of like different every single year. The system is the ecosystem. And then what the individual players are during the year, what individual annual crops we grow might change, what livestock we have might change. And I think that's part of the, uh, uh, the magic of the Savannah biome, the fact that it was uh, episodically disturbed somewhat at random. You never knew when this herd of bison would come through and just trample everything to death. And before the bison, when there are uh, mastodon around here, you got a herd of elephants coming through and they shred everything to pieces. Or you never know when this random fire is going to come through and burn everything. So the random disturbance, random massive disturbance, is how the, uh, the savanna biome has been managed for as long as it's been around. You know, tornadoes are another thing. So how did you get the perspective that you did? I mean, what what is it in your background and maybe talking a little bit about your about your background, your pre New Forest Farm days. Um, I mean, what what made you look at a piece of land and and see a, a mature oak savanna instead of seeing corn and beans Ooh. or or radicchio, you know, that's, as the case yeah. may be. Yeah, that's a and and, and oak savanna happens to be what we use as the model here. And everywhere uh, around the world, you're going to use a slightly different ecological model. I had gone to school uh, to study ecology. And uh, when I found myself in a laboratory taking aquatic insects out of formaldehyde, wearing a, like, uh, wearing a respirator, a splash goggles, and a rubber suit, and had a fume hood over the top of me, I said, wait a minute, this is ecology? <laughs> I want to like study nature. I want to be like Steve Irwin, totally dangerous. <laughs> um, prior, prior to that, uh, I had grown up in suburban Massachusetts, and uh, I'm weighing in at about 235 pounds, six foot tall. I'm the smallest of, of three boys in my family. And so my parents were under a lot of pressure to feed these, you know, monstrous, ravenous beasts. And during the, uh, like the whole oil embargo crisis in the, in the mid-70s, 
they started, they had a cute little garden out back, but once, you know, that, that, those time periods hit, uh, started to garden in earnest and also got a wood stove to heat the house and being the oldest one expected to be responsible and all that kind of stuff. Who got to do most of the work out in the garden? Me. Who got to do most of the work out in the woods? Me. Well, out in the garden, we, we tilled the soil. We used a rototiller back then. Then we started our transplants indoors under lights. And then we'd have to transplant them out. We'd have to water them. Uh, we were amazing compost makers. My dad actually was somewhat famous, um, you know, way back then in the 70s. He knew how to make compost. Wow. And all the long hair could come and learn from my dad how to make compost. And then um, you, have to, you have to hold the weeds. you got to pick the bugs because we didn't use any sprays. And then you got to harvest all the stuff. And all we got was like some vegetables, you know, some cucumbers and tomatoes and cabbages and squash. And we would still have to go to the store to get our staple foods. And in our case, it was like rice and beans uh, and meat and dairy products. So there was a lot of work, and we didn't seem to really get all that much food. We got our vitamins and minerals, our vegetables. We didn't get a lot of food to sustain the family. Well, so then I'd go out in the woods. Um, to cut wood. Yes, it was still hard work, but I was in the shade. There was an amazing amount of wildlife around, the birds, and squirrels, chipmunks, and uh, plus I, during whatever season it was and I was up there, there was all something to eat. There was, you know, uh, all kinds of little fresh greens and roots and vegetables in springtime from, you know, from ramps. They were mushrooms. They were raspberries and uh, grapes and hazelnuts and hickories. So here I was out in the woods and I had just as much, if not more, food coming out of the woods for almost zero work, just have to go get it. And yet out in the garden, it was like a slave factory. Um, that really, it really got me to thinking. It's like, how is it that it's so little work, you know, in, in the woods in this natural system, and it's so much work in the garden. Then I, I somehow stumbled upon or heard reference to a book called Tree Crops by J. Russell Smith. And the full title was Tree Crops, A Permanent Agriculture. It was originally written in 1926. And uh, Smith proposed that we develop a two-story agriculture and we grow uh, woody crops in the upper story. And we use the seeds and the fruit from those woody crops to feed livestock. And uh, although there is a fledgling acorn market uh, nationwide, if you were to go pick up acorns and eat them, they'd probably be very bitter, and you might have a hard time convincing people to eat them as a staple food. But right. if, you, if you feed them to pigs, uh, it doesn't take much convincing to have meat eaters eat bacon. And, and so that kind of stuck with me. It's like, wow, now we can get our meat if we have a system that's designed where we've got all these other foods coming off these trees that I actually like eating, like the grapes or the hickory nuts and the hazelnuts. Uh, and then have the pigs eat the things that I don't like, all of a sudden I've got fruits and nuts and berries. Oh, and conveniently, I can have a little vegetable patch growing in between each of the trees. And so that was kind of where it started. I was back in high school at the time, which was actually quite a few years ago. I'm curious, Mark. I mean, you know, that's, that sounds like the sort of a story that goes on the back of the book. Were you actually thinking about that stuff when you, were, when you should have been chasing girls and, and trying to buy a car? Well, what's really fascinating is I've never really understood this car thing. To me, it was a ride from point A to point B, um, and so I wasn't really into that. My friends were like, you know, oh, it's a 455 overhead jam and the heavy this and the Cuda that. And I had no idea. <laughs> Who cares? <laughs> I was, I was, I was uh, too busy running around in the woods, you know, finding new fishing holes mysteriously, stuff like that, and chasing girls. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we can just uh, chase the girls. And, and, and were you were you explaining then to the girls? You know, hey, look, I've got this great idea for how I'm going to change the world. Uh, yeah, yeah. And okay. Let's, let's just say that that sets a certain selection criteria, uh, <laughs> past which very few have gone. <laughs> so, but it, but at some point, you you found Jen, and she decided to go there with you, and. And then what happened? Well, <laughs> well, we met when I was working at, at the lab, and um, it was then I said, that's it. I can't do this anymore. I'm not going to, because, you know, I got to college, went to work, uh, 
in a laboratory, living in a concrete bunker, you know, in the cubicle kind of stuff. And it was just not, it wasn't a healthy environment for me. I had to commute 45 minutes to get to work in the morning, this big, deep piece of a car. You know, it was just, I said, this is not the way to live a life. I want to live, you know, out in nature, you know, et cetera. And I was reading, it was, uh, you know how each region of the country has like their, their regional uh, coffee table magazine? In New England states, it's called Yankee Magazine. It's got all the pretty pictures, and they'll, they'll feature this place or that place. Uh, in Yankee Magazine in the back, all of a sudden I saw this ad one day that said that they were going to close the Homestead Act uh, in Alaska. It was going to be the last homestead settling ever, and it was going to close in 1986. Uh, and I saw that. I sent away for the information. They sent me all the maps and all the information on how to do it. Uh, so I, as soon as I, I'm sitting at work, I got my coffee, my donut, my newspaper, and I've got all this material about this uh, this homestead offering up in Alaska. I took I took the uh, the newspaper and I slammed it down on my desk, and I yelled out two words, and the second word was it. And I noticed everybody stands up and they look over and they go, "Oh, I'm getting the shepherd today," and I I walked out. I went to my boss. I said, I said, I quit. He says, oh, is this your two-week notice? I said, no, you didn't hear me. I said, I quit. And I drove home and uh, went to Alaska and claimed the amount of land that I could get, which actually, uh, when, when we were there, it was only five acres per person. We got each of a five-acre home site up there, 300 miles north of town, uh, three miles off the nearest road. 3,500 feet up the side of the hill. You had to cross a river and two lakes to get there. Um, it was beautiful. I mean, we lived there, homesteaded there for uh, for eight winters. Wow. It was all of the storybook fantasies that you hear about. Just as cold, just as dangerous, you know, attacked by bears, stomped by moose, falling through the ice, all of that stuff. Cars not starting, catching the hillside on fire. It's all the, all the adventurous Alaska stories you ever hear. I like how you put stomp by moose and car not starting at the same level of adventure, Mark. <laughs> well, if you're, if you listen to this, you hike down a mountain, 3,500 feet, you walk out this valley, um, you know, three and a half, four miles, and it's 52 below zero. Um, what's happened is even if you're going really slow, you're going to perspire a little bit. So now there's a thin bit of moisture on you. It's now 50 below zero. You're wet. And if your car don't start, you've got like three seconds to get a fire going, and you're you're dead. That was one of the interesting things about that is if you made a mistake, it was over. I I turned into a real safety conscious and a lot more careful person. I was somewhat of a a, a daredevil kid, whitewater kayaking and extreme biking down the sides of mountains and stuff like that. And then after Alaska, when it, it became survival, it's like no, you just don't do that. And and at some point, you decided that Alaska wasn't for you anymore. Yeah, because we, you know, we had uh, decided to have a kid, and, and Jen and I were talking about, well, this is really, really, really rural. We love it. It's beautiful. It's spectacular. It's a hard life. It's a really hard life to try to figure out how to you know, get a, a couple of dollars to last you through the winter. And winter, for crying out loud, October through April, where you're basically, it's winter. <laughs> and real winter, not just this funny little lower 48 winter. Not this mamby pamby Midwestern winter. No, so we're trying to figure out well, what is it that we want to do? Where we want to live? We want to live rural, and because we had no resources at the time, and we're still paying student loans, uh, we have to go to a place that's fairly inexpensive to live, has reasonably affordable real estate, um, and a place that it can be uh, not just somewhat socially acceptable, but it's actually possible to live by getting by. You, know, you can do a little. You can cut a little wood. You can shovel snow for people's driveways. You can help out on farms. You can, you know, work at a bar, work at a bakery. Uh, you can find some driver truck. You can find something to do to survive in this part of the country uh, while getting by, while we're creating, you know, this this uh, new type of agriculture. All you have to do is let go of what you're told you're supposed to do. You know, no, don't knuckle down and get a good education, get a good job and work your funds off for the rest of your life doing something that you hate. You know, uh, just stand up and do what you're passionate about and to heck with the, the financial side of things to a certain extent, figure out how to make it work because 
And do do not what you think is right or what you're told is right. Do what makes you come alive. Because what the world needs is more people who've come alive. And if we're all living real uh, uh, abundant and alive, uh, enthusiastic, joy-filled, love-filled lives, won't the world be a better place? But Mark, I guess, I mean, the question that I'd have about that um, is, I mean, that's really easy to say until you run into the financial problems. I mean, until, until things, until it hits the fan. Right. Creditors can't eat you. <laughs> Creditors can't eat you. You have to figure out, of course, how to, how to stay within your means and uh, how we were able to stay within our means was by uh, being very frugal. Uh, we grow to this day 90% plus of our own food. The food that we eat actually is a byproduct of the other stuff that we grow and sell. Um, and so that, that's, that gets rid of that expense. Well, when we built the house, we didn't like, you know, borrow a million dollars live in a mansion. Uh, it, we, built, we built a 24 by 24. It was a single room at one point in time, just one room uh, out of concrete blocks. And if you count how many blocks are in there, I don't know what the math is right now. It's only like seven or 800, less than a thousand bucks worth of concrete blocks in the wall. So you got a thousand bucks, you get a nice solid foundation for the house that you're going to build over time. And you just build on it a dollar at a time, a dollar at a time. Um, we uh, started out off grid in part because in order to run electricity back to the house, it would cost $11,000. So we got one of those tiny little uh, solar panels, kind of like the ones that you use to uh, energize a uh, electric fence charger. We still have our original solar panel, this tiny little solar panel, and we ran a, ran a car battery. And then we had a dome light from our Chevy van, which actually is still operational. We're not using it in the house anymore. So we took the light out of the van and put it in the house, and now we've got a light. We caught water from the sky called rain, and we used that for, you know, for our water supply. Um, so we have no electric bill. We had no, you know, water bill, no well, no septic. Um, all of those expenses that so many other people have, we, we didn't. You know, to this day, the house is still it's all off-grid, um, roof water collection, you know, built into the hillside. It's a cozy, comfortable little place, but it's not huge, and, and it's not finished. <laughs> still not finished. So live live modestly, and if you can't pay some of your bills this month, you, you know, use your credit card to pay it this month. And then when you get money, it's like, see, so here's the thing with, with produce, and you know how this goes. All of a sudden, asparagus season rolls around. It looks like I've got a pile of money, right? Well, I've got to pay these past few months off, get current with some of my bills, and now I've got to hang on to this money until the cucumbers come in in July. Um, and so, you know, we have to get very good at budgeting. Um, plus, we also, all the different uh, uh, pickup work things that I've mentioned, uh, you know, I've, we've done it all, you know. Everything from, you know, tending bar to being a carpenter to, you know, house-sitting somebody else's place, anything to, to make a couple bucks to get by and living frugally. And then, of course, working at, at Organic Valley as the produce coordinator and that kind of as sort of this cornerstone of being able to get the capital that you needed to, in, to build out the various, or I shouldn't say build out, to grow out the various elements of New Forest Farm. Yeah, you know, when I worked at Organic Valley, I was only there for like five or six years and that was only part-time. I wasn't full-time. Okay. Um, uh, and then as far as the nursery stock is concerned, um, I stumbled onto the, the nursery stock uh, idea because I was, you know, working at Organic Valley, I became familiar with wholesalers. Uh, when I got to nursery stock, it's like, well, hey, why don't I go get it by bulk from a wholesaler? Because I've done this with asparagus. Uh, if When we bought asparagus for New Forest Farm, um, the retail price in a gurney catalog was a dollar twenty-five a crown. Um, if I bought uh, fifty thousand crowns or more, I could get them delivered for thirty cents a crown. It's like wow! So if I sell asparagus crowns to other growers for fifty cents each, I make twenty cents per. That means you know I'll pay for all my asparagus, and they get their asparagus at you know, two-thirds off the catalog price. 
So that's how I funded the asparagus. And I said, hey, that's you know, that's a really good idea. I need a lot of chestnut trees and hazelnut trees and you know, apple trees, cherry trees. So I did the same thing. And that that became another cornerstone of, of the economy, uh, the farm economy is the, is the nursery side of things. At first it started with buying uh, nursery stock wholesale. Um, splitting it up and selling it, you know, uh, slightly less than um, the catalog prices to, to other folks. And then as we started to have our own um, seed available from our own plants, instead of putting seeds in the ground and growing my own trees, why should I learn how to become a, a professional nursery? Why not go contact local nurseries and say, hey, you grow it up for me. So you find a guy who does it best and I contract with him. So I take my seeds to my buddy Tom. I said, hey, Tom, I'm going to deliver hazelnut seeds to you, and you don't even have to pay for them. And all of a sudden, he's listening. Wow, I don't have to pay for I don't have to buy seeds from my nursery. That's cool. So then he grows them out. I said, yeah, and I'm, I guarantee that I'll buy every single one that you produce. How can he lose? He gets free seed and guaranteed sales. He's happy. I'm happy. I get trees a lot less expensive. Um, so that's where the whole nursery thing was start got started with, with uh, figuring out how to buy wholesale and, and sell marked up product. I'm always kind of looking for the model. I mean, I'm I'm really attracted to to things where where that go you know step one, step two, step three, and it doesn't sound like. And and again, I mean, you, I don't feel like you're out there selling necessarily a process to somebody. I mean, you're not saying if you go do step one, step two, step three, you're going to have a fabulous permaculture farm. But your process was pretty pretty nonlinear. Well, and that's actually what I, I do. I do go up. Uh, this that right now, the past two years anyway, since my book came out, uh, it's been all about teaching others how to replicate this. And and so many people want to know. And they, I get to ask this over and over again. What's your number one cash crop? It's like, no, no, no. That's the old way of thinking. Nature is a system of systems. We are now systems thinkers. We are now going to manage this ecosystem. And if we're starting with a, you know, a naked cornfield today, how do we transition this from this naked cornfield over a period of 20 years so it's a three-dimensional, you know, whether, wherever you are in the USA, your particular biome, um, how do we do that transition? And there's very specific things that you do along the way. It's not a detailed, do this, do this, do this. It's not a recipe uh, cookie cutter list. It's how to approach the system thinking. And what is actually critically important is figuring out how to uh, play the whole financial game. <laughs> and, and one of the things with playing a financial game is to not be afraid of uh, – borrowing you know one of the one of the words for borrowing that gets used a lot is debt and debt is like this oh you're indebted this heavy weight on your shoulders that drags you down well in the whole investment community uh you use borrowing and that's called leverage because i only need ten dollars and if i can borrow ninety dollars i can buy a product that has a hundred dollar value i add a little value to it i sell it for 200 i pay off my debt I just made a hundred bucks and I I only started with 10. So to view borrowing as leverage and to leverage uh, what you're doing forward into the future. So back to the trees again, if you think about uh, this, I don't know how many trees have been planted on here uh, on this particular farm, but there's at least a hundred thousand plants, at least a hundred thousand plants on this. If you look at your nursery catalog, seven bucks a piece, 100,000 plants, and $700,000 worth of plants on this farm. There's no way I can afford that. It's too expensive. That's the old way of thinking. I said, all right, 100 acres. I need 100,000 plants. Wow, just look at the money I'll be able to earn through the years. Because every single plant on this property was put in either at zero cost or at a profit. If you buy an apple tree, if you can buy wholesale apple trees for you know, ten bucks a piece, and you can sell you can sell smaller quantities of them for fifteen dollars a piece. You know, we have to sell half the trees to other people, and it pays for your tree. You can put your apple trees in for free, and that's leveraging what you're doing instead of thinking it all as an expense and as a debt and as a burden. 
this is an opportunity. How can I spin it to an opportunity? Think about it. Anytime, anytime that you have a problem or there's something that's an expense, somebody's making money on it. Well, who is and how are they doing it? If you're, if you're planting trees, nursery stock on a farm, some nursery is making money. Well, why don't I start, why don't I be the nursery that's making the money? So, I mean, I'm just curious. I mean, how do you find, I mean, you, you're planting a farm full of apple trees. I mean, you have no small number of apple trees at New Forest Farm. How do you find a market for all of the apple trees that you need to sell in order to pay for the apple trees that you're putting in on your ground? You, <laughs> you just start talking and talking and talking and you meet people and you call orchards and, you, you know, put the word out I, I, once, upon, once upon a time. I was actually myself and Clyde with the uh, Howard Rotivator Company. We were the first two uh, display tables at the uh, uh, Organic Farmers Conference, Upper Midwest Organic Farmers Conference. And, you know, Faye Jones, the uh, coordinator, was just like happy to have, oh, wow, you guys want to put up a table? That'd be so cool. So I've been there like every year for the past 19 years. I've gone to, you know, different, um, you know, Woodland Growers Association meetings. You pay to have a table. Uh, you hang out with the, I've, I've hung out with the whole agroforestry crowd um, from National Agroforestry Center and University of Missouri, Columbia. I've stayed within those circles for, you know, for 20 plus years. And you just, um, when, when you don't have a job, so you have the freedom to like go to conferences and meetings and uh, volunteer for nonprofits. And then you can speak your piece about what you're doing and, and get people enthusiastic about it. You said that there are some there are some steps to take when you're getting started in this kind of an operation, even if it's not necessarily a plant this, plant that, but a a series of steps that you might take in terms of shifting your mindset and I and I would imagine kind of build the skeleton of what you're gonna hang the cucumbers and the zucchinis and eventually the hazelnuts and the chestnuts onto. Yeah, so like the first step is is you're doing the homework and the first step is uh learning about your local biome, you know, the local ecosystems near you, and then do some historical research. What were they 100 years ago, 200 years ago, 18,000 years ago? Just look at what were the species represented near you. And then uh, I've got a book uh, right here uh, near me. It's the Natural Plant Communities of Wisconsin, and most states have some information uh, database about that, and I can't give you links or anything like that because <laughs> I haven't done that homework. Um, and you just look through the various different uh, natural plant communities, and there's like all these plants listed. And well, you pick out the tall trees that have a, a marketable yield or have yields that will be consumed by livestock. You pick out medium trees, shade tolerant trees. You pick out shrubs, pick out cane fruit, pick out vines, uh, very shade tolerant ground covers. Uh, different kinds of fungi in this particular system, and that becomes your skeleton. Those are the keystone uh, plants, plant communities in your area. And then you just start planting those in rows, and that, that's, that's the first part of understanding your biome. second part is managing your water resource. Um, it doesn't matter where, where you live. Uh, there is no plant that we know of can survive without water. Some can go for many, 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 many years, uh, but no plants can survive without any water. So to do a little bit of earth shaping um, in the early years to capture your water, spread it out, soak it in, uh, or if you're like in the Netherlands to drain it properly, you know, there's, there's different water management issues, uh, whether you're in an arid environment or a humid environment, sandy soil or clay soil, but manage your water resource be like step two. Then you start planting these trees and shrubs that you've got in rows, following the pattern that your water management system laid out for you, and using your uh, your agroforestry techniques, alley cropping and silvo pasture, especially. Um, you start planting your cash crops in the rows on the alleys between the rows of trees, and grazing livestock uh, in the alleys between rows of trees. That's the basic overall pattern where you would apply it almost anywhere that you would go. And then uh, uh, you will be doing uh, mass selection breeding, Luther Burbank style uh, plant breeding. In my book, I, ref I refer to that, the, the technique, the management technique as stun, sheer total utter neglect. And 
like what you had mentioned earlier, when you throw something at the wall and hope that something sticks, you think about a tree uh, in nature. I've got a maple tree right outside that I'm looking at. Underneath this maple tree, there's got to be 50,000 little seedlings all sprouted. How many of those 50,000 seedlings are going to make it to turn into a mature tree? Maybe one or two. That's how nature works. But the one or two that made it, they made it for some reason. They, they had some kind of genetic predisposition to tolerate the soils, the hot, wet, dry, cold, ice, you know, weather, climatic extremes. They were somehow able to survive all the diseases that are around, all the pests that are around. So those trees that actually made it through that mass selection process are superior for that site. So that's the breeding technique that we use to, uh, you know, to have to develop the plants that are resistant um, to pests and diseases that, that also are site adapted. And that, that's the basic technique. And then you just live a good life and eat well. <laughs> that, that sounds really easy, but I mean, you, well, Mark, you came to my farm in, it was, it was 2002 or 2003. I can't quite remember now. And, and we kind of, we laid out a plan that we didn't really end up following through on, on most of it, but we did take a, a field and put it into a chestnut and asparagus patch a year later. And we had, well, we had a dry spell. We didn't water the chestnuts. We, we had complete loss on the chestnuts and, and it really, you know, and at that point we, we ended up turning back and focusing on our annual vegetable crops with the exception of the asparagus field, which continued to yield incredible amounts of asparagus out of a, out of a mass of thistles. <laughs> I mean, I guess from from my own perspective with the interface and obviously not doing a deep dive into it with you, but just sort of glancing across the surface, you know, I wouldn't say that we had a lot of success. And I, I look at something like the the sheer total and utter neglect for breeding and selection work and I go, wow, you know, we spent a lot of money on chestnuts and a lot of time putting them in and, you know, we got nothing. And how do you walk that line between the potential for complete loss and the fact that, I mean, you can't afford to, you can't afford to throw $2,000 away very often. You got to get something out of it. Yeah. That, that's actually why, you know, stunned, sheer total utter neglect. Uh, you know, my wife, Jen has insisted that I they change that because it's not sheer total utter neglect. It's more like strategic total utter neglect. So like in the establishment year, one, you know, one, two or three years uh, when you're putting in those trees, it's in your best interest to take care of them. And, you know, get a little bit of water on them, get a little bit of weed control. Uh, so it's not total, total neglect, although in many cases it ends up being total neglect because life rears its lovely head. And, and like you guys, I mean, you had a family to feed. You have this operation. you gotta, you got to get your, you know, produce out and uh, get it to market. So that took priority, and the trees had to take a back seat. It would have been nice maybe if there was some tea tape laid down and you could drop water on it a couple, three times in summer and probably still have chestnuts there today. But, um, so it's more strategic um, neglect. What, what, what I do not do and will not do, uh, uh, not going out and I'm going to groom every single apple tree. Uh, I think, <laughs> I don't know if you were involved in it, but a, a number of different apple growers, they're probably the ones that have the hardest time at, at my farm because they come out to this, this apple orchard. And it looks like a disaster. I mean, it, there's like dead and dying trees all over the place. There's trees that the, uh, the cattle have ripped branches off that are knocked over. Um, you know, places where the pigs have like scratched on it so much with their butts that they'd want to bark off the tree. And they're just like shaking their head. It's just, this is, a, this is a, a total disaster. But you think about it, I, I spend nothing on inputs, zero on inputs out there. Any inputs, let's say fertilizer, uh, is put down by the animals. Weed control, done by the animals. Uh, when I harvest anything, I don't have to get five to ten bushels per tree in order to, you know, to pay back my expenses. I had no expenses. My only expenses actually were profits because I was, I was selling cut flowers. Uh, I had got honey from all the flowers that were out there, growing mushrooms, pigs, and cattle. So there's five different economic yields um, out of my apple orchard. Oh, and then I go pick apples. Well, you know what? A lot of the apples have worms in them. So when we're picking the fruit, if it's got worms in them, you just drop it on the ground, and you only pick the good ones. So everything that we go through, we share a picking cost with every other apple orchard that's out there. But we have none of the other costs, zero. So if you have zero expenses 
and not only harvest one bushel of fruit per tree, but pure profit. And I, I know apple orchards, uh, I've worked with apple orchards that have, you know, gone bankrupt. And if, and if you spend, if you lose $10,000 a year on, a, on your apple orchard, uh, it's not a positive economic direction to go in. If, if you have, and, and this is going to sound like a heresy at first, but this, this actually comes from an actual example with a client of mine. He had lost $10,000 uh, a year for like, you know, three, four, five years in a row. They called me in. We had a little talk. They didn't like what I said. Two years later, they lost $35,000 on their orchard. They called me back in. I said, okay, here's what we're going to do. Um, last year, it cost you $35,000 to have this, for the privilege of having this orchard, you lost $35,000 more in expenses than in sales. What you're going to do this year is you're going to take a vacation. And I said, what? So yeah, you're just going to walk away, walk away from the whole thing, and you come back next fall and harvest apples. And I'm willing to bet you a nickel that you'll go out there and you'll be able to harvest, you know, maybe, maybe a one hundredth of your total yield will be perfect fruit, grade A, top quality, and you did absolutely nothing to it. What we did is we turned your economic numbers, negative $35,000, we turned it into $5.50. That's almost an incalculable rate of return on investment. That is, <laughs> and it sounds funny, but it's not. If, if you're not making money farming, walk away, throw your seed potatoes out in the pasture, throw your garlic out in the pasture, and come back and look for some next year that was free. And, and if you do that enough times, uh, it actually it actually can work financially on the rate of return if you have enough stuff out there. My asparagus, you see my asparagus, it, it looks like this, you know, a, a, an asparagus patch that's undergrown with a tremendous amount of weed. I do nothing, no sprays, no fertility inputs, anything on that asparagus patch. All we do is we harvest it. Um, I only get half the yields of what you would expect out of a out of a field asparagus. Oh, but my expenses are zero except for the labor harvested, the harvest labor to go get it. And if you do enough things that way, um, it adds up. And then if you think about the ultimate cleanup crew, what happens to all those warming apples that were on the ground? Who comes in after I'm done picking apples? I assume you're turning in your pigs or your chickens or your turkeys. And then they go in and they clean up. Who eats all the squash that's not marketable because it's, you know, bent or twisted or has diseases on it? The livestock comes in and cleans up. And they turn it into these nice little fertilizer packets. It's great. And, of course, bacon. And I'm all in favor of bacon. Okay, so don't get me wrong <laughs> okay, here. Okay. But it, but as a as a neat and tidy guy, this – I mean, I, I have to admit I'm, I'm cringing a little bit as you're talking about this. I mean – I mean, I, I work a lot with growers on the idea that, that they need to increase the amount of success that they're having. Um, it seems, and, and, and I guess I'm trying, to, I'm trying to reconcile that with what you're saying, because you're almost saying the opposite. You need to decrease the amount of success that you're having. No. Yeah, but that's no, not no. quite right. That's not, no. what, that's, not, that's not a fair characterization. You're, so go ahead and say no. I'm just going to say decrease your expenses. Decrease your expenses because what's interesting is you look at agriculture, everything that you, that you read, or most you know courses that you take, you go to university, it's all about do this, do that, do this, do that. Well, do, 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 excuse me, it's do, do. And if you do anything on the farm, it's either your time, it's your money, you had to buy something, you had to buy a new piece of equipment to spray this different thing, you had to mix this compost tea, you had to make these effective microorganisms. And it's like work, 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 work. For what marginal rate of return? Grower after grower after grower, Chris, I mean, you know this is a fact. I've been in this area for 20 years. I have seen, you know, young idealistic growers come out here, uh, come and go, and I buy their equipment cheap because they, they, they come in, they have all these ideas of what you have to do and they're supposed to do, and they do everything by the book. They do it very well. They do it professionally, and it doesn't pay the bills. So I don't, I don't buy that as a valid model. You know, if, if you're spending more than you're, you're harvesting, it doesn't work. And you're working your ass off and running yourself into the ground. <laughs> so, yeah, I, I, it's, just, it's just a totally different approach. And here's one of the things, too. Is there's not, not any one enterprise on this, in this whole operation that will pay all of our bills all by itself. But altogether, this constellation of enterprises 
does. And it doesn't always. There's sometimes that, you know, geez, I got to go drive a truck. You know, sometimes, gee, I got to go work in a lumber yard. It's not the end of the world because now what's the rest of my, the rest of my year look like when things are actually going okay? Um, I'm hanging out on the farm with the boys, and I'm not out in the produce patch working my buns off with my new Danish time weeder and, you know, all these different other pieces of equipment are spraying this and spraying that. I'm up in the boundary waters with my boys fishing. We're going camping here. We're going climbing up, up in the Rockies. Uh, we can live a life of leisure. Uh, simply because we're not like doing and doing and doing and doing and doing. We just don't have all that much money. That's, that's, that's just good. But what would you rather have? Uh, a plus on your side of the economic ledger or a minus and have to move back to town? And I, you know, I'm not, not trying to be you know, personal or, or mean or anything about that, but that's just the way it is. And if, if you're spending money on inputs and you're working your buns off, you're on the wrong track, man. It's, that's a slippery slope. Not that I don't work. I mean, I'm 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 working almost all the time, but I just uh, it's not with the same intensity, uh, and it's there's not the sense of urgency like you would have if you're in a, uh, a perfect. I, I love hanging out with Elliot Coleman because he is he is a master of what he does, and he's all about creating the perfect conditions for this you know one individual pepper plant. He'll do everything in his power to help that pepper plant come into its genetic potential. It's the almost exact opposite of what I'm doing is that if you're not going to be able to come into your genetic potential on this farm right here and you die, good riddance. I don't have time for you. And that's a lot of plants go away. <laughs> we, we kill a lot of trees. We think you lost a lot with trees. Oh, my gosh. I, I killed a lot of trees. Hey, Mark, I need to take a quick break to get a word from our sponsors and we'll be right back. The Farmer to Farmer podcast is made possible with the generous support of Vermont Compost Company, helping plants make sugar from sunshine since 1992. Through 23 years of producing the best potting soils you can buy, Vermont Compost Company founder and owner Carl Hammer has stayed intimately involved in the company, working with a small staff of committed individuals to provide compost-based potting soils chock full of microbial partners and humus-bound nutrients. The people at Vermont Compost Company have a practical understanding of the challenges organic growers face and combine that with a comprehensive understanding of soil and plant sciences and an intuitive comprehension that often has Carl and his crew sticking their noses into a handful of compost, inhaling deeply as though they were sampling a fine brandy. Vermont compost is the real thing, built on consistency instead of glitz. Like the donkey on their logo, Vermont compost potting soils aren't glitzy or glamorous. They're steadfast and consistent, stubbornly making certain that your transplants can get everything they need from a few cubic centimeters of soil. Oh, and the donkeys are the real thing. You get a little bit of donkey manure on every batch of Vermont compost potting soil. Feed your plants the best. VermontCompost.com Bandwidth for the Farmer to Farmer podcast is brought to you by BCS America. BCS two-wheel tractors are often mistaken for just a rototiller, but it's a truly superior piece of farming equipment. Engineered and built in Italy where small farms are a way of life, BCS tractors are built to standards of quality and durability expected of real agricultural equipment, the kind of dependability every farm needs. I've worked with BCS tractors for over 24 years, and I wouldn't consider anything else for my small tractor needs. And I'm not the only fan. More than 1.5 million people in 50 countries have discovered the advantages of owning Europe's most popular two-wheel tractor. And these really are small tractors with the kinds of features found on their four-wheeled cousins and a wide array of equipment. Power harrows, rotary plows, flail mowers, snow throwers, sickle bar mowers, chippers, log splitters, and more. Check out bcsamerica.com to see photos and videos of BCS in action. bcsamerica.com. And we're back. Hey, Mark, before our break, you mentioned Elliot. I mean, Elliot's running a much smaller farm than you are. And, and it would seem to me that maybe that's one of the differences is if you've got 106 acres, you've, you've got some room to not have everything be maximally productive. Um, whereas if I, I, I mean, I just, I'm just trying this out here, but if you've got, if you're working with five acres or one and a half acres, you, you really need to push that as far as you can, if you're going to get the, the kind of output that you need to get in order to cover your expenses. And, and if you have a smaller acreage like that too, there's also, you have more time available to you. It, it's, you know, it's interesting is, is I tell people I've done, you know, 10, 12 acres of produce. I'm like, oh my gosh, how many people have to do this? Like, just me. Like, just me. Just, you know, do it farming techniques instead of gardening techniques. 
Uh, and and there's, a, there's a dramatic difference because of size and scale. Uh, you know, we use different different techniques, different tools, different equipment. The first, if you're going to go to work in the morning and you're, the first thing you do is grab a, a hand tool, you're gardening. And you better be doing it at a very small scale. You better be really close to market because you need to get a higher price for the smaller quantities of stuff that you're growing. Whereas if I've got, you know, four acres, I got, you know, 150,000 pounds of acorn squash, all one variety. Uh, I'm not switching gears every five seconds. I'm going out in the morning and I'm picking acorn squash all day long. I'm going to pack acorn squash all afternoon. I'm going to deliver the stuff that I packed, you know, a couple of days ago. And then to get up and do it again in the morning, there's a lot more efficiencies uh, when you're at a certain scale and you have to have access to different markets at, at, a, at a different scale. So like our squash, for example, if you're going to be if you're going to be doing it gardening scale, CSA, a couple acres or whatever, uh, you better have access to a really good high paying market really close because you're going to get eaten alive on transportation costs. You've got to make sure that they're, you know, that, that you're selling as much as you possibly can. Like exactly like you said, you have to maximize what you're doing. Well, on my side of things, I have to minimize my expenses because I'm getting paid probably a third of what a, a, a retail grower would be getting. And I have to have a huger quantity, so I don't have time to pay the plants. I don't have time to do this, that, or the other thing because it'll just, it'll just burn the cash meter. So it's just a different approach, and I think it has a lot to do with the market available to you. If you were to come out here to southwest Wisconsin, four and a half hours from Chicago or the Twin Cities, and set up on a little, you know, three-acre piece of property and uh, operate under the illusion that you're going to grow an Elliott Coleman-style market garden and sell everything direct to the consumer and make, you know, fifty thousand dollars a year. Uh, you're hallucinating. No one could. Yeah, ever, I, I, nobody's been able to do that yet. It's exactly what we did in Decor, Iowa. Yep. Um, you know, and, and I think, well, even it seems so, like maybe even, even in Decor, you were closer. You were closer to the market. Much closer. Yeah, we were. We're an hour and a half closer to the Twin Cities than yeah. you are there. That's and, true. And, and you're in Decorah. I mean, that's that's bigger than yeah. Richland Center. <laughs> <They're far. laughs> right. <laughs> that's true. That's true. Um, Mark, I think this is um, this is really interesting to talk about the, you know, here we are talking about the vegetables and on the, you know, in the context of this permaculture arrangement. So when you're doing vegetables, obviously you're not doing things like salad mix that require amazing weed control and, and high fertility and a lot of labor going into them. You're choosing much lower labor, more what I would almost think of as commodity crop vegetables. Correct. And, and if you're, if you are a market, you know, market farm scale, uh, you could still use the perennial polyculture techniques, the agroforestry techniques, permaculture, restoration agriculture, whatever you want to call it. You're just going to manage it differently than I do. Instead of uh, having it be more of a natural system uh, that is managed with animals and a certain degree of neglect, it'll be a lot more intensively managed. Uh, probably wouldn't hurt to have some some animals, perhaps you know a couple of sheep, a couple of pigs. You can put rings in their noses if you want, so they don't plow things up. Um, and have these other crops planted. You still have your your same garden beds uh, the way they are. And between your uh, your fields, uh, you put these rows of trees or an over under um, arrangement, like with uh, chestnuts up high, hazelnuts underneath, or chestnuts up high, currants underneath. Check out what they're doing at the Woody Perennial Polyculture Site at University of Illinois, Urbana. That's on uh, it's an eight-acre um, organic uh, market garden kind of arrangement. And so what you would do then is you would do a little bit more care of your trees because it is a small acre, and you will you will want to uh, you know make sure that there's not all this pest and disease. If you only have five chestnut trees in the whole operation, you can still list a, a couple hundred pounds of chestnuts. And if, if you've seen what they're retailing for, you know, they're re- retailing at a co-op here for 10 bucks a pound last fall. You get a hundred right. bucks, hundred bucks off five trees, or a hundred pounds off five trees is a thousand bucks. It's nothing to see that. And you can still have some of the advantages, some of the advantages with having uh, a canopy or uh, not a closed canopy, but a, a partially shaded canopy uh, over your crops, especially like salad mixes, spinach, and cilantro. Um, 
is you'll you'll have cooler conditions for a longer period of time, and uh, you won't you know cook stuff. You won't your alleys won't dry out as fast because you got a little bit of a light shade going on, and you'll manage the uh, the branches. You'll be pruning. What you will want to do is you will want to do some root pruning uh, next to the row of trees so the trees don't send roots out into your um, into your vegetable uh, alley and take nutrients and moisture. And that would be by going through with something like a subsoil plow and and basically just cutting the roots with that, right? Right. right. And I've, I've, actually, I've actually seen folks doing it uh, uh, market garden scale. They just have one of these long-nosed shovels. And they just jump, jump, jump. They go all the way down the hundred foot row. You know, every every uh, they were doing it in the spring. You know, you know three feet out from the tree. Uh, ever and do it ever since the very first year you plant that tree. Do a little root pruning. Just to, it's kind of like uh, a soil block that once the roots hit the outside edge of that soil block, they don't they don't grow past it anymore. So what you're doing is you're you're slicing off any root that did make it past that line and creating a little air barrier. And you just they, they'll they'll put roots deeper, and then they'll put their other roots within the row. So the trees will still do fine as long as you you start doing the root pruning when they're young. If you wait till they're bigger, you'll uh, damage too many big roots, and you can get decay in your tree, and it'll shorten their life. So tell me a little bit more about how you're actually managing your vegetable crops on. At, at New Forest Farm, then I mean you've got you've got the winter squash. Um, I know when I was there a couple of years ago, you had. You were doing, I think, red bell peppers. Right. Um, you've got the asparagus. You said you're not doing any weed control in the asparagus, but you must be doing some in the annual crops. Yeah, uh, in the asparagus, how we manage the asparagus is, uh, you know, if you look at, if you look at the wild asparagus going on the side of the road, nobody's managing that, so that's that's what we're imitating. Um, and while we're actually harvesting it before the season starts. I'll uh, mow it really close, scalp mow it, almost clip the ground. I do that when the soil is firm but still cold. And then once the asparagus starts coming up, we'll pick it uh, until we can't see it in the weeds anymore, and I'll scalp mow it again. And sometimes it's two, oh, maybe as many as four times we'll mow it during the season, depending on uh, moisture. But what happens is if you keep scalping grass uh, that close, it really sets it back. Well, when the asparagus is planted, you know, eight inches plus deep, uh, so you're not going to be damaging its crown at all. So it outcompetes the grass and it's just taller than the grass. So by the time you stop harvesting in uh, mid June, you know, into early July, that's when you know you'll stop sometimes. Um, the asparagus will get so far ahead of the grass, the grass has been hammered into a blip. Well, then with the uh, with the uh, other annual crops like bell peppers and uh, cucumbers or zucchini, whatever we're growing, a winter squash, uh, we will start our seeds in trays outdoors um, when you would normally, you know, plant them in the ground. <clears throat> Not necessarily uh, to get a jump on the season, uh, but to get a jump on the weeds. And so we'll we'll disc up the field ahead of time. Uh, and let it turn green and disc it again, let it turn green and disc it again. So maybe two or three discings prior to planting. I'll let it settle maybe a day or two at the most, and then we transplant into that. So what we've done is, is and we're just tiny little plants. We're not growing them out for a long period of time. Like for, for squash, the plant may only be seven to ten days old, really, really small. Uh, and then um, we're ahead of the weeds. And I just use a, an old 1930s era uh, spring tooth cultivator um, pulled behind my tractor on either side and um, cultivate maybe two, three times at the most. If, if I get if I get everything um, cultivated by 4th of July, I'm a happy camper because then, you know, everything's easy. Of course, timing is an issue. Uh, <laughs> You know how that goes. Sometimes it's too wet. We get too far ahead of you. So then, when when weeds do get ahead of us, this last this last season, I, I should have been happy because of the regular rainfall we were getting. But you know, doggone it! As soon as it's time to go plant, it rained again. It gets too wet. The weeds come up. It goes green. And then, uh, if it, if it does, if we do get too far ahead of us. We'll use a uh, wheel hoe. You know, the, uh, I don't know what they call it. I had it for so long, but it's got that one wheel way up front, a little wheel, and then we have yep. a, a nice 18-inch 
you know, one foot to 18 inch wide uh, stirrup hole attachment on it, and you just walk the rows and then get back with the spring tooth cultivator. And that's all, that's all we do for weed control. And again, if you've got some weeds in that system, you're not too worried about it because you're probably moving out of that field next year anyways. Correct. Yeah, I'm not too worried about it because then after, uh, so how, how we, since squash is a heavier feeder, is we'll put the squash into freshly turned, um, I'll call it sod, but it's not a real sod when we turn it over. But it'll be squash first in the fresh plowed ground. The second year we'll go into the peppers. And if you have too much fertility in the soil with the peppers, it'll go all plant and no fruit. So right. since you've already, you know, taken, you know, the, the first big slug of nutrients, that first decay rush, you, you fed the squash with it. The second year, it's a little bit hungry and it's perfect for the peppers because they freak out and they, they have extra blooms. And we'll have these little tiny pepper plants that don't even reach knee high. And they'll have like three or four different sets of fruit through the, through the summer season on that. Uh, Either crop in the fall will uh, will put winter rye down, and so if it's uh, squash followed by winter rye or winter wheat, winter triticale, whatever is available at the time, then we would follow that that with the uh, bell peppers, and then after the peppers, we'd put the, the the small grain on in the fall, and in the spring, as uh, soon as the frost's out of the ground, we top seed with uh, yellow sweet clover or a red clover. I like the yellow sweet clover because it has a, a single terminal bud and it's a lot easier to kill uh, later on when you're prepping the site for produce. So then we'll go ahead and we'll, we now have this uh, a rye patch with clover as an understory. We let it grow till it's fully mature and the seed is ready for harvest. We'll either uh, combine off the seed, we'll trample graze it with livestock, uh, or what I'll do is I'll just take the uh, front end loader on my tractor and put it down on the ground and just press it down flat as could be. So now I've got all of this uh, <laughs> rye straw mulch with all the rye seed in it. Um, and then the clover comes up through that, will sprout up through that, and that'll grow six, eight foot tall and set seed, oh, shoot, like three feet with some seed heads on the, on the yellow sweet clover sometimes. It's crazy how many seeds they put out. Uh, and of course, they say that with, with uh, sweet clover, you'll get about 100 pounds of honey per acre. So uh, we're getting all of that carbon. That's what we're doing primarily. That's my goal is to get all of that carbon in the form of that dry, hard, woody straw and dry, hard roots. And we get the nitrogen from the clover and all of its biomass gets included. And depending on which numbers I'm using from which website, um, in theory, we're accumulating about 20,000 pounds of uh, hard, woody organic matter. <laughs> per acre using that system. Well, if you remember, I pressed down that, that rye, all that rye seed starts to sprout. Well, then in the fall, I go do the same thing with the uh, clover. Either we graze it down or we, you know, we uh, uh, or mash it, roll it. Uh, then there's all this rye seed that's sprouted. Then there's all this clover seed that gets scattered everywhere. And what comes up next spring? The rye comes up green. We just do it again. I've had one field that I kept for five years uh, doing that, and I've never had to reseed it with rye. And I even harvested uh, with a combine a couple couple times, got the rye off of that. So just by the way we managed it, <laughs> by the way we managed it, we were able to plant a rye crop once, you know, and get yields for five years, and then then turn it under. Uh, most of the time, the rotation only ends up being it goes squash, peppers, rye, rye, back to squash. And those are fields dedicated for that purpose. That's those are your vegetable areas. You're not using those as as you're not trying to rotate in with the rest of your livestock operation or or the other the other crops that you've got going there. Well, the, the livestock will come through. The livestock will come through in the fall after we harvest the squash. You know, the livestock can come in and eat it. After we harvest the peppers, they can come in and eat it. And actually, it is part of the system because it's alley cropping. On either side of the field, we have the, the rows of trees, and I'm standing right next to uh, a couple of my flattest fields. And this one is uh, it's a row of apple trees. The next one is hazel, hazel, chestnut, chestnut, then a mix of hazel and chestnut. You know, so those, so it is uh, it is part of the system. The tree crops are there. Well, thanks, Mark. With that, let's let's turn to our lightning round. And and the first question I always like to ask is, what's your favorite tool on the farm? My bed. Your bed. Yes, I like sleeping. 
<laughs> Actually, probably the favorite, my favorite tool. Let's see. I know I'm supposed to answer quick, huh? <laughs> my, my favorite tool. I got a, I got a uh, 40 horsepower uh, New Holland tractor with a eight foot Bertie orchard mower. That orchard mower is really slick. Grind it'll grind up a four foot branch. Really nice. So that's like a flail mower type. It's a it's a flail type has especially shaped especially shaped hammers on it. it. Really grinds stuff up fine. You can you can grind up three inch branches, and by the end of next summer, it's all decayed. It's gone. It's part of the soil. I mean, as as somebody who's who's really breaking new ground, even though you're not breaking a whole lot of ground, um, what's your favorite resource when you're when you don't have the information you need to make your decisions? Where do you turn? Nature, observation. When you look around, you, if you see what's working in nature, and imitate that. I can't overemphasize that. I mean, that is so critically important. Yes, the computer is nice. Yes, the books and resource, all this is all great stuff. It, it, it pales in comparison to the truth of reality. So let me, I'm, just, I'm gonna, I'm gonna diverge here and, and ask, you know, where, where do you start with that? I mean, I, I remember uh, when I was here at the University of Wisconsin as an undergraduate taking taking a course in the vegetation of Wisconsin and trying to trying to understand anything that I was looking at out in the out in the forest, uh, out in the prairie, out in the savanna, wherever, and trying to put together those things when I didn't even know the names of things. I mean, how do you where where do you begin? with that kind of observation. You gotta understand, I, I <laughs> it's pretty obvious by now, I roll a little bit differently than most people. What the hell do you need to know the name for? Oh, look at this thing. Instead of observing what is what are its actual characteristics? Oh, this is this is taller. It's straight, it's crooked, its branches spread this way, it makes this much shade. Oh, this one has berries. Hmm, those berries made me sick. Oh, this one has berries, they're tasty. The birds like that tree. They don't like this tree. There's no weeds under this tree. You just look around. What's actually happening? Who cares what the names are? That's 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 pure observation. To to know the name and the label of something, that's not knowledge. You know, that's that's a, that's memorization. Cool. That's you know, evening primrose standing out in front of me. Big deal. But does that tell me anything about its habit, its characteristic? Is it an upright plant, a spreading plant? What's the roots look like? What's growing underneath it? What kind of mushrooms are in associated in association with it? Gee whiz, that mushroom stinks. It tastes terrible. That one, mm, that smells pretty good. So go back to to what our ancestors must have done, pre-language and everything. You just go out and you explore. You have no labels for stuff. Go out and just interact with it. See, also, I have to, got to, got to explain this for a while, too, is I was 22 years old, I think, when I moved out to the bush in Alaska. And for the past 30 years of my life, I've lived in nature. And I've derived my economic livelihood uh, from nature. And so when I talk about nature, I'm coming from inside of it to talk to you people out there. I'm not some guy who is in the suburbs or the city studying at university or learning online and talking about nature. You know, I've been in it. And the way to actually interact with it is to get out there and get in it and leave these silly labels back at the university on the computer and try to observe what is it, you know, see, hear, taste, touch, smell. Uh, how does it behave? What's the soil like here? Is it wet? Is it dry? Is it hot? Is it cold? Very, very simple observational skills, and you'll see patterns. Human human beings are, are outstanding at detecting patterns, and that's what we want to start seeing is these patterns over and over and over again repeated on the side of the road and, you know, state parks and natural areas that have the secrets. You wouldn't believe the stuff that you're surrounded by, no matter where you are in this country. You know, I'll, I'll go and do workshops in California, and people start talking about, oh, well, we could do this and this, and I'm like, stop what's right here right now. And nobody's even looking at what's growing in the ditches on the side of the road. Let's actually get out here and observe what's really going on for real and not put a label on it right away. But anyways, I, I diverged. Not at all. Um, what's your favorite crop to grow? Asparagus. Uh, you know, if, as far as the cash crop, if, if I could pick 100 acres of asparagus in a day, I'd have 100 acres of asparagus going on. 
Yeah, that's actually a, a, a critical number. Is the reason why we have two acres of asparagus is one person who's a motivated picker can pick two acres worth of asparagus, pick it, uh, trim it, band it, put it in a box, put it in the cooler, and get it to the warehouse in a, you know, from 5 in the morning to 2 in the afternoon. And then you got the rest of the day to get some work done. Uh, so, and, and it's just, you pick up the nickels off the ground. It's incredible. It's a great crop. <laughs> I always I loved harvesting asparagus. Do you guys are, how are you out there picking it? Uh, what do you mean? You out there picking it? Well, you guys, well you're, you, I I I'm imagining that you're not out there with a with a paring knife, carefully uh, carefully selecting each stem as you scoot down on your automatic asparagus harvest. No, no, you just actually now think about this. This is very interesting too. Um, I'm um, a lifelong, at least since I was a teenager, anyways, martial artist. When you go out. Today's work on the farm, right? Well, this isn't work. Work, this is another label that we put on something. Now let's go out and do our training. And so when doing asparagus, uh, just uh, try to perfect your form and do a lunge. You step forward, you drop the hind knee down, your back is straight, you know, no bending involved here. You reach down and snap it off a ground level with one hand, if, you know, whatever your dominant hand is, is the picking hand, and you uh, you've already marked on your wrist, maybe with a magic marker or a pen or something, the, the length of the right length. So you reach down and touch it and you snap, and you're within, you know, within a quarter of inch of, of accurate, so you don't have to lose much in trim. Then you stand back up again and step forward. And in, a, in the course of a morning, it'll be about 4,000 to 5,000 lunges a day. And you get what's called, we call gorilla butt. And yeah. I, I can walk straight up trees almost. I mean, it's, 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 uh, <laughs> it's in incredible shape. It's, in, it's, it's training. It's not work. You now, if you just go out sloppy and you bend down and pick it up and bend down and pick it up, you'll have a bad back in no time. It, and actually, repetitive stress injury is one of the biggest uh, biggest injuries for um, you know uh, market farmers. So think of it from now on as training and have be totally relaxed. You can go fast, but don't hurry. Hurry is an interstate. Fast is a rate of, of work. So you can go fast, but don't hurry. And try to perfect your form. Every step you take is training and perfecting your form. You're doing kung fu out there. And if you could go back in time and tell your beginning farmer self one thing, what would it be? Um, it, it would be to put more of something in the ground at first. Uh, instead of saying, yeah, I'm going to experiment with hazelnuts. So I'm going to put like, you know, three over there and see how they do. Well, it's like three, six years later, you find out that, oh, I only got like four cups, eight cups of, of hazelnuts. It's not worth it economically to put in way more than I think I need because some are going to die anyways. Uh, and I need a certain quantity to either feed me or feed a, an animal or to sell to somebody, or to justify the equipment to do some basic processing on. So I would go overboard on on putting in uh, more perennial plant material up front than most of the uh, uh, the books or internet websites tell you to. Mark, thank you so much for being on the show today. Well, you're welcome. All right. So wrapping things up here, I'll say again that this is episode 49 of the Farmer to Farmer podcast and that you can find the notes for the show at farmer to farmer podcast.com by looking on the episodes page or just searching for Shepard. That's S-H-E-P-A-R-D. You know, Mark and I were talking about martial arts and I got my black belt in Taekwondo about a year and a half ago. It's something that I wanted to do for a long time and I still feel pretty proud of it. We had a saying in Taekwondo, though, when's the right time to learn Taekwondo? before three guys dump, jump you in a dark alley. Of course, it tends to be when you're standing there staring at the three guys with scowls and big sticks that you think to yourself, oh yeah, I wish I'd... So much of farming and farm life is about preparation and anticipation. It's actually something we're pretty good at as farmers, right? When's the right time to plant lettuce seeds? About 10 weeks before you want to pick it. We know you can't just expect that lettuce to show up. The trick is transferring this understanding to the other important areas of the farm, the business, the infrastructure, and the family life. That's why I'm so excited about my upcoming two-day short course in Kansas City on January 25th and 26th. We're going to talk about how you can take your farm to the next level with management that helps you monitor and improve your performance in all areas of your farming operation. Schedule and registration information is available at cultivatekc.org.
I'm also pretty excited about the employment workshop that I've got coming up in Grays Lake, Illinois on February 17th in 2016. Employees make it possible to get more done, but managing workers and their work takes dedicated time, energy, and processes. And I'm going to share what I've learned in 25 years of farming and working with farmers about how to make employees work better for you. More information, including schedule and registration information, are available at purplepitchfork.com slash betterboss. I'll also say here that I'm going to be out at the Oregon Small Farms Conference in Corvallis, Oregon on February 20th and at the Moses Organic University and Organic Farming Conference February 25th through 27th in La Crosse, Wisconsin. With all of that out of the way, I'll say that if you enjoy the podcast, I think you would also enjoy my weekly email newsletter, The Flying Rutabaga. You can sign up at farmertofarmerpodcast.com or purplepitchfork.com. And if you enjoy the show, it would be great if you would pop on over to iTunes, comment on the show notes, or tell your friends on Facebook. You know what else? I'd love to hear your suggestions for guests on the show. Please visit farmertofarmerpodcast.com and use the contact form to tell me who you'd like to hear. Thank you for listening. Be safe out there. Keep the tractor running. (laughs) 